So let's talk about event sourcing. Raise your hands, please, if you know what it is. Um, now raise your hands if you've done it. Okay, cool. So some people know what I'm talking about. I'll try to explain it to the others. So my name is Lina. I'm a backend engineer. I work with Scala at this great company, Wix.com. You might have heard of us. And uh, we are hiring, as you also may have heard already. I work with an HR application, which is quite big right now because we've been doing it for two years now. So to explain event sourcing in as simple terms as possible, I made a small application, just the very basic one, and I'll show you some parts of it. So once you apply to Wix, you're a candidate. And candidates are precious, very important to us. So we're going to log everything that a candidate does or has done to them. And we will use the log as the single source of truth. The other things we want to do with the, uh, with the candidates is look at their timelines to see history. Um, all the things that were done before, maybe some positions they applied years ago. We also want to do research on uh, hiring processes. Are we doing it right? Are we taking too long? Uh, are the candidates happy with it? And also we want to be ready for future requirements, which are all very good reasons to use event sourcing in the first place. So how to event sourcing, you just write everything that happens and then append only log. Like if you have a candidate created event and then you want to edit them to change the phone number or something, you don't actually change the created event, you just add an edited event with the, with the part of state that was changed. And then you're going to read from the log, but that's later. Let's discuss the writing side first also known as the command side uh, from CQRS, uh, command query segregation. So what happens is users send me requests. My users are HRs, hiring managers, and interviewers. And these requests are mapped to commands, and these commands have to be validated against aggregate state. As you all know, this is the last chance to say no. No, you can't hire this candidate because they haven't applied. Because once uh, the command becomes an event, that's it, it's done, it's, it's in the log, you cannot change it anymore. So validation is very important here. And the interesting thing about validating against aggregate state is that you don't have aggregate state in event sourcing. You just have a bunch of events like where's the aggregate. So let's discuss what an aggregate is. Uh, let's say each candidate is an aggregate in domain-driven design. Uh, it's probably a human being who has some attributes like phone number and name and address and uh, positions they've applied to. But in event sourcing, an aggregate is also a sum of events of all the things that happened to the candidates. So Basically, what we start with is we take no one, we take an empty candidate who is perfect because, you know, no one is perfect. And we apply each event in the order they happened. And we apply uh, appropriate changes to from each event to this aggregate. And in the end, we have a current state. So here's some code. It's my favorite function in the whole pattern. It's basically you take an empty candidate and you take a sequence of events and you fold left the events on the empty candidate. Uh, each of these functions returns uh, a new copy of the candidate with all the changes applied. And there's also some pattern matching, but I guess, you know, it's not new to you. Uh, just a small diversion. I, I was told you can do this in Redux. I'm going to do it soon, but not tried it yet. But yeah, you can do event sourcing in co all kinds of uh, things, not just with Scala. 
So it's just a pattern. You can do it with anything you want. So anyway, uh, this whole thing works just fine until you start getting lots of traffic. Once you get in production, you are going to have lots of commands coming in and lots of events being generated at the same time, and you're going to get race conditions. So it's very important in event sourcing to keep the order of events and the causality. Each new event has to be, to have been validated, uh, to, to, to be valid. So concurrent writes are going to be a problem. But uh, since I don't have much time for this, I suggest you watch uh, Tom Gabel's amazing talk, How Shit Works on Time. It's on YouTube. He takes 40 minutes to explain how time works on computers. It's really great. I suggest you watch it. And we move on to query side. So one thing to, uh, one way to deal with event stream if you don't want to query it directly is you do projections. You set up some event handlers, which are projectors, and you just uh, basically do the same thing with the as we just did with the aggregate. And projec projections are wonderful because they are derived data, which means you can drop them anytime and just generate new projections whenever you want. So they look like uh, important uh, tables, but they are, you know, replaceable. You also have event handlers which may have side effects, like, for example, send the message to Kafka or to another message queue, or maybe send some emails to some users. Like, for example, an email that you were assigned to interview this amazing candidate. And you don't want these side effects repeated every time you replay your events to regenerate your projections. So you have to keep these event handlers separate. Just make sure, you know, side effects, no side effects have to be kept separately. And now uh, a time machine is a concept, like often, uh, often mentioned when people talk about event sourcing. Oh, you can use it as a time machine. And, uh, you know, I actually tried to make one. Because uh, if the whole system is a time machine, you can replay your projections, um, all of them, to a given time moment. For example, let's see the state of the system as it was on the new year or whenever. But that would take a, a, a bit of time. Uh, replaying projections takes from an hour to four hours, uh, depending on the size of your system. So maybe, I don't know if it's very big, it may take a while. So I made a very simple time machine which only replaced one aggregate. Um, what it's useful for is you can debug things to see, uh, to find illegal state, to find bugs, to find tampering. Maybe someone has been deleted some, deleting some events and, you know, it's not allowed in event sourcing. Also, your event log may have, you know, these blobs, payloads, uh, JSONs, things like that. You can make them visual with your time machine, so you can see things more easily. And uh, it's also useful because you can add automated checks. So it will warn you of some things, so you don't have to manually look for them. So let's see how that looks. Right, this is Jon Snow. We have already seen a bit of him. He knows nothing. He applied to work with us, but uh, the time machine is warning me that he has no positions, which shouldn't be that way. Let's just go back in time just one step to see that he has really started as no one. And we go forward again. He has no positions. At the next version, he has uh, applied to a position, but we see that no people have been assigned to interview him yet. Why this happens is basically there's one command, create a candidate uh, in this position, and this one command should also assign uh, some people, some users to interview him. 
but uh, what happens is one command generates a sequence of events, three events in this case, and the time machine is just showing state between these events, which should happen in a very short amount of, ti of time. We should actually write them in event log as a batch, because if we don't, we are going to have race conditions sooner than expected. So anyway, time machine just lets us see state between these events. As we see, interviewers have been assigned on the same day, so there's no reason to panic. There are people who are going to talk to Jon Snow to see if he really knows nothing. Um, let's see what happens next. All right, we have a spoiler alert. Uh, someone has changed uh, his name to his real name. In 2015, it would have been a major spoiler to those who watch Game of Thrones. Uh, so, let's see what happens next. Yes, we see that someone is trying to hide his real name, not just for spoiler reasons, but to keep him safe, of course. So, but since we are in event sourcing, it's very plain that you cannot hide anything from us because everything is in the log and nothing can be changed. So we have the spoiler permanently written in the log. So now we see Jon Snow going to work abroad for, I don't know, the Dragon Queen probably. We see him come back, apply to back-end engineer position in two years and a half. He, assumingly he now knows something. And this is uh, the happy end, I guess. This is where he leaves the system. He, of course, remains in the log, but uh, our, our users cannot see him anymore because the system doesn't let you work with hired people, just the candidates. So let's see a, a different kind of candidate right now. Since we are almost out of time, let me just scroll past. This is Ramsey Bolton. He's a very dangerous, violent psychopath from ha Game of Thrones, so he should probably not get hired, but what do you know? He's applying to two positions, which is going to be important in just a minute. Uh, we have, again, someone trying to do some spoilers, and his dad trying to hide it, but it's even sourcing, you cannot hide anything. So now we see a thing that is worse than Ramsey Bolton himself. We see him hired in two positions at once, which should never happen in my system. The time machine is telling me to get out because this is wrong. These two hiring managers are going to have my head because each of them, you know, is happy they have hired this awesome candidate. So now let's see what actually happened there. It's one of those, uh, my favorite mistakes in event sourcing that uh, happens if you're not careful with evil things. So what happened with Ramsey Bolton, there were two hiring, higher co candidate commands fired at around the same time. There was a race condition so each of these uh, commands was uh, validated against aggregate state, against the same aggregate state with which was uh, version 7. And uh, in a good candidate table, this would, cap would have caused a primary key violation because you cannot have two events with the same version. But since I created a bad candidate table, especially for this bad candidate, which has a timestamp in its primary key. Uh, both events at version 8 were allowed to happen, to get in the log. And now we have this bad state where, you know, the command wasn't actually uh, validated properly. We have two events which uh, contradict each other. And I have actually seen this happen in a real project. It causes very strange bugs, very rare, because you don't have many concurrency issues, many race conditions in a hiring system, because there aren't so many of these candidates at the same time. But 
uh, it was causing bugs for around a year until before it was found. So basically, this was me exploring the the mistake that uh, was mentioned in the video that I uh, referenced earlier. So I suggest that you really watch it and you don't make this mistake and you don't have at least this one problem. Um, I hope this motivates you to watch that video anyway. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can ask in a minute. So lessons learned. My favorite thing about event sourcing is you can't cover anything up. You have everything in the log. Uh, you, uh, you can hide it from users, but you can always dig through it uh, using a time machine or other tools and find all the problems that they were trying to hide. And it's basically not that hard to do yourself, so you should try it. And uh, also, do apply to work with us. As you see, we have lots of fun with candidates. And yeah, any questions? So uh, the question is, uh, say you need to comply with uh, European uh, GDPR law and some candidate requests uh, removal of his personal data. How do you handle this situation? Thanks. Delete by ID. Uh, so uh, in case you, you keep all the events, uh, you, you can only uh, add a removal event. But uh, previous events about hiring are still kept in the uh, storage. Yes, so this would be going outside the pattern and actually deleting something from your append-only log. It's not read-only, you know. You can actually delete things from it if you have to. So you just delete all the events associated with that candidate and the candidate is gone. He never existed. You never had him in the first place. Uh, I mean, all the events associated with him are gone including candidate-created candidate event, so he's just no one, he's gone. Okay, thanks. Yes? How have you actually fixed the issue with the concurrent updates of uh, one entity? Yeah, when that happens, it's very bad. You again have to go outside the pattern and migrate your event log to a proper table without the timestamp in your primary key, you have to select all the events that are that look wrong and actually probably manually resolve them, which of, of them are wrong, which of them actually happened. It's a lot of hassle, so I suggest you do it right the first time. Oh, how you prevent it? You just use a proper table. You just do primary key without the timestamp in it. Because version number is designed to prevent these things. It's called uh, some kind of timestamp. You know, you just use version numbers. And uh, basically, with that candidate ID and that version number, only one event is allowed to happen. So it's called optimistic locking. Uh, if there's a race condition, you try to write both events, and the first one wins, and the other throws an error. It's a primary key violation, so it doesn't get written. And basically, the, the command throws an exception. And th this is where you just deal with it uh, in the application level. Like, maybe you just propagate the error back to the user. You cannot do this command, you know, because he's already hired. Like, half a second ago, someone else hired him. Too bad for you. Uh. Yeah? Uh, thanks for talk. Uh, qu question: If if you maybe ha have an experience with uh, other timestamp like uh, primary keys like uh, Cassandra UUID with timestamp involved inside, uh, do they have some issues? Just in case, if you know. I I haven't looked in Cassandra because I'm a bit mistrustful of databases that compact your events. You know, because I want to keep all my events, but. I don't know how they deal with it. I'm sure there is a way. Hi. Uh, what kind of data storage are you using for your event sourcing? One question and whether maybe related. Uh, you mentioned that it takes two hours or so to run through all the history to pull it up. Why does it take so long? Or is it like you loaded memory? Or what's the process involved in that? It's just a lot of events. 
I mean, in HR application, and it, it may take just an hour, but there are bigger applications with more data, bigger blobs. I don't know, it just happens that replaying your projectors takes some time just to write everything again. Of course, you can uh, batch some, if, if some things in projections to make it faster. You can stream from MySQL actually to make it even more faster, but it still takes time because you have to go through the whole event stream. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you asked which, uh, what database we're using. So yeah, we're using MySQL. I used uh, H2 for this toy project because it was, you know, fast to set up. It's just SQL things. More questions? Feedback? Anything? Evil questions? Uh, have yes? you considered using uh, Kafka streams for that? It seems that most of the functionality is already there, including uh, uh, state stores, uh, uh, evaluations, uh, changes in uh, schema support uh, using schema registry, uh, so uh, and uh, the storage itself. Yes, we have thought about Kafka and decided not to use it. Uh, Why? It was a while ago, but uh, we didn't like that, you know, a Kafka cluster may like report that it has your data when there's only one node alive and then the node dies and you've lost some data. Uh, that's one thing with Kafka. Other thing is it also compacts data just like Cassandra. Um, I, we wanted to keep all the events, you know, as they are. And maybe as advanced some, but we didn't look at it after, you know, we started with MySQL, so uh, I guess we just didn't trust Kafka back then. Okay, thanks. There's one more. Um, have you seen Datomic? And if you've seen it, do you have any thoughts? Datomic. If you don't know, you can't answer it, but if you've heard about it, how would I've you compare it I've heard about it. What should I think about it? Can you explain more? Um, well, there will probably be a video from this. Uh, <laughs> I had a I'll talk about it yesterday. Oh, cool. I'll uh, watch it. But uh, We can I talk after. I just wondered if you had some thoughts already. OK, sure. Yeah. Yes. Cool. More questions? Evil questions? Come on. Ask me anything. Hello. If you yeah. use even sourcing, it's interesting for me why you why why uh, why you don't use snapshots. Oh, snapshots. Yes, of course, because uh, because you 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 say previously that uh, restore even to take a lot of times. So why don't you snapshots? Yeah, snapshots is a useful optimization. I didn't mention it because I only had fifteen minutes. Uh, in an HR application, we don't need snapshots because we don't have that many events for each ag each aggregate. Like, how many things can you do with a candidate before you hire them? You know, not that many actually. So yeah, we don't do snapshots because we haven't needed them yet. I know some projects at Wix which do use snapshots because they have much more data. Uh, it's just you know outside the scope because I only had 15 minutes, so. And uh, the the next question is: uh, Do you use Aka Aka persistence, or you or you use some any kinds of tools of libraries? We don't use Aka in this project. I think maybe we switched from Spray to Aka HTTP, but it's not the same thing. And we don't use Aka persistence. More questions? That's it? Cool. Thank you for attending. Okay, thank you.